You know that ravens are nasty birds. When a group of ravens is called a conspiracy, and you've seen them sitting by the side of the road, feasting themselves on some roadkill, they'd hardly be the kind of birds that you would want to deliver your food for breakfast in the morning. But here in the account of the life of Elijah in 1 Kings 17, we read that uh, the Lord directed him to go to a hide by the brook Kerith, which, says the scripture, flows into the Jordan. And the Lord says, It will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Now, clearly, the ravens are unclean birds. And I want to think just for a few minutes about how sometimes God uses those who are unbelievers to deliver food. And the first is a story found in uh, a book on, on the life of Lord Radstock. It's called Lord Radstock and the Russian Awakening by David Fountain. And it's the story of Count Korf. And uh, he was the Lord Chamberlain at the Tsar's court. And he made a trip to the World Exhibition in Paris in 1867, and uh, he began talking to someone at the British and Foreign Bible Society booth. And to his surprise, uh, when he returned to Russia, he received 3,000 copies of St. John's Gospel. And he was supposed to distribute these for the Bible Society. Well, he was horrified. And he was sure that the Russian Orthodox Church would come after him for this, um, but they gave him permission. And so he distributed those. And uh, the fact was that Count Korf wasn't even converted. Eventually, he distributed in 1870 alone 62,000 copies of the Bible. It wasn't until 14 years later that he was converted and was exiled as a result of his uh, his testimony. So here was a man who was actually doing the work of God, even though at that point he was what we might call a raven. He was an unclean uh, communicator of the truth of God. And you remember how the Lord told Paul that he actually was being used before he was converted. He was the one that God used to scatter the Christians, to spread the gospel around the ancient world. Well, this is another story. I was uh, some years ago visiting with Dr. David Gooding in his home, and he picked up a copy of a Bible and handed it to me to look at. It was a Macedonian Bible. Now, there is a northern province in Greece called Macedonia. This is the home of Philip of Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great. But then just north of that is a country called Macedonia. It's the southernmost part of the breakup of Yugoslavia. And it's it's landlocked, but its uh, western border lines with Albania. And when I was visiting in Albania, I went with the missionary there, Brother George Sturm. We traveled across the border um, from Pogradets and went up into Macedonia. And at that time, it was completely closed to the gospel. After the breakup of Yugoslavia, Macedonia was a communist country. It was a one-party government. The... Orthodox Church was allowed to continue. The Greek Orthodox Church had a rather stranglehold on the country. And if you wanted to hand out one gospel tract in Macedonia, you had to get clearance from both the communist government and from the Orthodox Church. And so the country really was locked down. Well, um, it so happened that a Bulgarian woman came to faith in the Lord Jesus 
through the witness of some Sudanese students. And she married a Macedonian man and so ended up in Macedonia. And she had heard that there were some Dutch believers, especially a a wealthy contractor who had set aside some money for producing Bibles. And she sent him a note and all it said was, come over and help us. And when he discovered that it was 1994 and that there was no what you might call a canonical Bible, in other words, Genesis to Revelation, uh, what we would consider a Protestant Bible without the apocryphal books, that there wasn't one found that uh, in the land of Macedonia. And so um, they began to pray about this. Well, I think it was his son. I'm not sure. I think his name was Peter. Uh, he had traveled to Macedonia on a tourist visa, had gone in and made contact with an old linguistics professor who had translated the entire Bible by himself into Macedonian on a Russian typewriter. The uh, the documents, it was an A4, which is a little bigger than our 8 and a half, 11 sheet, was three feet high. Well, the problem was that Greece greatly objected to Macedonia calling themselves that because they said, Macedonia is ours. and um, But you couldn't fly internationally into Macedonia. You had to fly into Greece. And uh, this young man had to get this Macedonian manuscript out of Macedonia through Greece and back to Holland so it could be printed. When he got to the airport. He had these two huge suitcases full of this manuscript. And he got up to the counter, and just as he arrived to have his bags checked, suddenly there was a hubbub down one end of the concourse, and the man behind the counter ran down to see what was going on, and he walked right through with this manuscript. The The Bible was printed in Holland, um, and Then contact was made with the government. Now, the government was a communist government. And um, at that time, the the president of um, Macedonia, uh, let's see if I can find his name here, Kiro Gligorov. And uh, he was... He was an atheist. He had been Tito's lawyer, and he was an atheist and a communist. <clears throat> and, and yet, because the Macedonian language was such a political issue, and uh, the, the people of Macedonia were eager to have their own identity, he, he agreed to a meeting with this Peter. And so, Peter, uh, by faith, they ordered uh, 47,000 Bibles and 80,000 New Testaments, which cost them 300,000 guilders. They did this in faith, and uh, within a short period of time, exactly 300,000 guilders were provided for the printing of these Bibles. They arrived, he arrived there. He couldn't, he couldn't bring the Bibles through Greece. And so actually this president, Macedonian president, had his own private plane pick him up and fly him into the capital. And uh, he, he appeared before their whole um, government, all of these government officials, and he shared the gospel from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, through chapter 6, verse 2, and ended with the message, today is the time to repent. And he preached the gospel to them. And he didn't know if he'd be thrown out or not. He was given five minutes. He ended up spending 30 with them. 
the the president said to the minister of education, this is a landmark to have this Bible translated into Macedonian in our own language. And this minister of education said, absolutely, we need copies in every school, in every library, in every government office in the country. And the communist government distributed the first whole print run of the Macedonian Bible. Ravens delivering the food. Just an amazing story. This little lady, this this dear lady, saved by the grace of God, sends out the message, come over and help us. Saved through the gospel shared with her by some Sudanese students. And then eventually, uh, the Bible printed in Holland, uh, delivered to Macedonia, distributed across the country by the, the communist government. What a wonderful thing. Eventually, I think it was about 15 years later, the president died, and word was sent to Peter in Holland that this dear man had put his trust in the Lord Jesus. He did repent, after all. So be encouraged, Christian. God has all kinds of agents, you know. The famous story about uh, the little lady, Christian, who was down on her knees asking God to to provide her some coal. And uh, uh, it was cold in the winter, and she had no money for the coal. Well, over there, the houses in the little villages are hard up against the, the, the street. And the, the town infidel heard the little lady praying for coal, and he thought he'd play a trick on her. So he went and bought a bag of coal and put it in front of her door and knocked at the door and ran away. Well, she came out and found the coal. Well, he knew exactly what she would do, and in a few minutes he saw her with her coat on going down to the market to tell all her friends that God had provided the coal she had prayed for. And so he followed her down, stood in the shadows, waited till she had given her testimony, and then he laughed and said in front of them all, it wasn't God who provided the coal. I heard you praying and I provided the coal. And the little old lady said, well, God may have had the devil deliver it, but no, it was a gift from him. (laughs) May the Lord encourage you and bless you and make you realize again, God is at work in the world in surprising ways. He even uses ravens to deliver food to accomplish his will.